My message this morning is when God comes down. When God comes down. Now, folks, I'm not going to preach this to a dead audience. I said God is trying to speak to us. He's trying to break through. We're not going to try to make something happen. But when the Holy Ghost comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, and folks, please don't mind when I say Holy Ghost, that's King James. It says, you know, that may offend people in this uh, everything correct day, but uh, I'm so used to that, pardon me, if I say the Holy Ghost is coming down. But when he comes, now here, here's, what, here's the, the heart of everything I've been preaching lately. <clears throat> the Bible says the devil's coming down, coming down upon the earth because he knows he has a short time. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows his time is short. Now, I will never believe ever that God would allow the devil to come have free manifestations with opposition, no opposition, and just have his way and the Holy Ghost not come down in greater measure to come against the powers of hell. We need an outpouring of the Holy Ghost greater than Pentecost because the need is greater. They never had, the devil had not come down yet. They didn't have hydrogen weapons. They didn't have what we face today. They didn't, didn't have gay marriage. They didn't have uh, uh, in your face blatant homosexuality. They didn't have what we face. And God's not going to leave us powerless. He's not going to turn us over to the, the wiles of the devil. I want us to sing, He's Alive. And when the Holy Ghost comes, He will glorify Christ. He will glorify no man. He will glorify Christ. Before I preach this message, it's burning in my heart. I want you to, now I know you've been standing, and some of you visiting us can't see around the people that never sit down. <laughs> we can't help that. That broke out in this church years ago, and we can't help that. But one more time, will you stand? He's alive, alive, Jesus is alive. That's the message of the Holy Ghost, that Jesus is coming, that he's here in power and majesty and glory. Isaiah 64, please. Isaiah 64, first five verses. Oh, that you would come, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, that the mountains might flow down at your presence, as when the melting fire burns, the fire causes the waters to boil. And that's what he's doing. He's putting the flame to the fire, and the fire will come to a boil. To make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When you did terrible things, that means amazing things which we look not for, and you came down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he has prepared for them that wait for him. You will meet him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Those remember thee in thy ways. Heavenly Father, come by your spirit now. Send your spirit in greater measure. Lord, you have been here by your spirit. There has always been a measure. You were poured out, but, oh, God, you said in the last days there would be a last rain. And we believe that, and I trust you now to speak to our hearts. Sanctify my lips, my heart, my mind. Come and take control, Lord. Let the word flow from your heart. Let everyone hear what the, ha the Spirit has to say. Quicken my very speech. Quicken the vessel, O Lord, and sanctify our ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. Amen. Amen. Oh, God, tear apart the heavens and come down. Uh, where did that cry come from? Some say that's Isaiah. That's it's his heart. And others say that there was a holy God-seeking remnant in Israel that was crying out. But we do know that somebody's heart was stirred. Somebody said, God, you have to do something. Somebody said, Lord, we can't go on with the same routine week after week and year after year. Oh, God, there's a lethargy 
in the house of God. This was the cry that somebody said, we have got to touch God. Somebody. Now, I believe it was Isaiah, and I believe it was the congregation as well. But there was a cry in the middle of the routine, in the middle of service after service, in the middle of the pageantry and the prophecies and everything else, there came a sound, there came a cry from the body. Oh, God, we have to have a visitation. We have to have you come down upon us. There has to be a manifestation like we have never known of your presence. This is the cry that we find here, we bring into your attention now. In spite of all the religious activity, you see, this, this came, this cry came in a time of great prophetic preaching. It came in a time when there was much religious teaching. The scribes and Pharisees were teaching and going down deep in the synagogues were well attended and they were going through the pageantry. They had solemn assemblies. They, they had charitable activities. There was a lot of activity. Everything looked religiously correct, but there was no presence of God. There was no presence of the Lord in the house, in the ministry. And the Bible says they got weary and God said, I have a controversy with my people. And it, he, he said, my people, he asked the question, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? Answer me. And prophet Isaiah said, in speaking for the Lord, there's no one that's calling upon my name that is stirring up himself to take hold of me. He said, he's looking around at all the political, all, all the religious activity and all the prophecies. No one prophesied more powerfully than Isaiah. They sat under that preaching and were growing dead. And he looks around to the church of that day and he said, there's no one. How, how long does this go on without God awakening his people? How long does this go on without the presence of God how long does the enemy prosper and prevail against the church? And he says, I don't see anybody. I don't hear that cry. Well, folks, you look around today, we have more tools for evangelism than any other generation. We have more media. We have more knowledge of the human psyche and the human mind. We have great preachers. We, we have best music. We've got instrumentation. We have everything we have more tools, we have more charitable activities than any time in church history. But you can go to church after church, nation after nation, you can walk in and you cannot recognize, you cannot experience the presence of Jesus Christ. You cannot experience the presence of God. You cannot walk out saying, I am alive. Something was there. God was there. God was in the house. Folks, I don't want to come to church if God isn't there. I don't want to come and just sing some songs and clap my hands and then go out empty and dry. I want to know the Holy Ghost was moving on me from the pulpit and in the pew. We have more money. We've got the most beautiful houses of worship. We, we have everything that we need. But see, there has not been this cry until now. About 150 years ago, the same cry was heard. This cry came from about 120 meeting in an upper rented room in Jerusalem. And the times then mirrored the times of Isaiah. Because there, there, John the Baptist was... Thundering his message of repentance. The Son of God was walking the streets. There was religion everywhere. They were very devout. They were coming from all parts of the world, the known world at the time. Jews were pouring into Jerusalem and Judea. Israel was coming together in Jerusalem. All the sacrifices and all the church activity and, and, and pomp and ceremony and routine. And you see, they rejected 
Christ. They rejected the Son of God. But the Lord loved his church in spite of what was going on in that society. That society had turned away the offer of grace. But God said to 120, he said to his disciples, you go and I want you to tarry in Jerusalem. I want you to wait. Now, they were not waiting just for a calendar date, a date on the calendar. The Bible said when the day of Pentecost fully come, fully come, they were in one place in one accord. One accord means that they, they were coming together as a body to one purpose and to one promise. All they had was a promise, nothing else. God said, I'm going to come down. I'm going to send my spirit. Everything's going to change. I'm going to come down and melt the mountains. I'm going to melt every mountain. I'm going to, and folks, if you had, if there had been a prophet rise in that upper room and say, the Holy Spirit's going to come down as fire on all of you. And all of those out on the streets who've rejected the message, those to whom you thought, those who you thought had hard hearts and will never listen to the gospel of Christ and you've seen it hopeless and you see nothing but death all around you, spiritual death and routine. He said, it's all going to change. It's all going to change in just one day because the Holy Spirit's going to come down and there are going to be 5,000 people saved in just one service. And all those hard-hearted, all those hearts, this mountain of unbelief, this mountain of hardness, the Holy Ghost is going to come down as fire. And he's going to sit on you first, and he's going to melt every mountain in you. He's going to take away the fear. He's going to put faith in you. He's going to bring your spirit to a boil. And you're going to get on fire for Jesus. And the very mention of his name is going to bring people to their knees. And even those hard-hearted priests and all of those who stood up against you today, who seem so hard, tomorrow, they're going to come flocking. They're going to come to hear the name of Jesus. It's all going to change. Why? Because God's coming down by his spirit. Folks, if there was ever a day we needed God to come down, it's now. If ever it was a time that God would so desire to break up our uh, churchianity and break in on our programs. Folks, I see something coming. I've been seeing it for weeks now. That's all I've been preaching about. That if God can find a people, you, you see, God strikes a match, but he has to have some kindling. He has to have some place to put that match. And that's what the Holy Ghost is doing right now. He's preparing a people. He's getting them right with one another. He's bringing people together in the spirit. Not, not this false love that gives in the gospel and gives in just for the sake of shaking hands with another church or another doctrine. But coming down to purify ourselves and focus on Jesus. And when that happens, what is coming is not going to be in one place. It's not going to be in one place. You're not going to have to travel hundreds or thousands of miles to see or hear of revival. You know, that's not going to happen. There'll be no evangelist, no pastor starring. It'll be like the upper room, but far greater. The Lord said he's going to save him the best wine for the last. He said, I'm going to give my little flock the kingdom. And folks, what is coming is not going to be in one place. It's not going to be just in New York City. It's not going to be anywhere else in the United States in one place. It's going to be in Asia and England and Europe. It's going to be in South America, North America. It's going to be in little churches with small unknown pastors. And the Spirit of God sovereignly is coming down because Jesus is coming and he's getting his bride ready. <clears throat> there will be no TV cameras. There will be no program. There will be no leadership conferences. I'm not knocking these things. But when the Holy Ghost comes down, when the Spirit comes down, He removes all those other focuses. And the focus comes away, comes away from just charitable works. We do charitable works. We support, we support orphanages all over the world. Teen challenges work with thousands and thousands of drug addicts in over a thousand centers. Yes, we are charitable. Yes, we are social. 
sociable. We, we, we work clearly for the human needs around. But folks, when the Holy Ghost comes, he brings the focus back to where it belongs on Jesus and the saving of the lost souls. Saving the lost. Folks, God help us if this church or any church gets away from the focus of the Holy Spirit. And that's the winning of lost souls to Jesus Christ. May that be the focus of this church. And when this breaks forth, and it is breaking forth now, I've received a call from, or in fact, I had a visitation from a, a leader of a, a large denomination, said, we as a denomination are so hungry, we're so thirsty, and that's what God is doing. He's creating a hunger, and he's creating a thirst in his people, and he is drawing them to himself. And then there's no need, there's no need then for man. We, we, we have to have programs. I'm not saying God does all, away with all these things, but he, he brings us into focus. There, there are three evidences I want to talk to you about whereby you can know that the Holy Spirit is sending the rain. There are three evidences that, that I want to focus. There, there are many others, but I want to just talk about these three evidences. First of all, there's a renewing of the hunger for Jesus Christ and his presence. So here in this church, we've be begun to taste, just taste a little bit of what happens when the glory comes. The type is in the Old Testament when they're dedicating the temple and the glory and the presence of God came down so they were unable to minister. You've seen that in this church and it's being seen in other churches where the Lord just comes down and he breathes. The spirit begins to breathe and suddenly Jesus Christ is magnified and that hunger and thirst is being met. And that's one of the evidences. We've had a measure of that in this church. But in, it, the time comes when you walk in the door, you expect to meet him. You expect him to be there and your heart is open. And this is an evidence that the Holy Spirit is moving. When there, sometimes there'll be a holy hush where people just sit in his presence. Nobody trying to make a sound. And the Holy Spirit just seems to shut everything down. And there's a powerful, beautiful spirit of Christ. That is evidence. And then there are the times when you can't stop shouting and praising God and leaping for joy because the Holy Spirit is a spirit of gladness and joy in a time of darkness. Are you hearing me? I don't have a long sermon. I, I see this coming. And, and either I've lost my mind, or I've been called to bring to your attention something God's trying to do. I'm so hungry for a greater revelation of Jesus. <laughs> Folks, if we don't have that, it's not just a sing and a shout. It's something that says, I don't want to leave this house. We've seen that here. When Pastor Carter called me about six, seven weeks ago, he said, Pastor Dave, this morning we, we tried to dismiss. We told people to go home. Nobody would go home because Jesus was here. Nobody wants to leave his presence. Folks, it's a, sometimes it's a shame when you stand outside of some churches and 12 o'clock sharp, I mean, there's a beeline in a parking lot. Everybody is rushing to get out and watch out if you're in their way. <laughs> the second evidence that I want to talk to you about is an outbreak of gladness. That's one of the surest evidence that the Holy Spirit has begun moving in a supernatural manner, is that there's an outbreak of joy. 
Now, folks, we have had that in this church. We're not boasting on this church. If you've been coming for the 20 years we've, we've been here, you know that at the very beginning, where there was repentance, where there's true repentance, joy ultimately breaks out. Great joy and rejoicing in the Lord. But I'm talking about a triumphant sound that is beyond anything that we have known in our lifetime. A triumphant praise that the Holy Spirit breaks forth upon his people. Thou will meet him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Isaiah 64, 5 that we just read. The scripture says, sing unto him. Talk of all his wondrous works, for great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Glory and honor are in his presence. Now listen to this. Strength and gladness are in his house. Strength and gladness. That joy is your strength. And folks, God is not going to let us go out without a shout. The scripture says very, very clearly, the ransomed of the Lord shall come to Zion and say, And with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. And they shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sadness shall flee away. Folks, when the Spirit of God comes down, there will be a a sound of praise that's indescribable in its power. I'm going to Spain, the Lord willing, next month. Pastors, bishops from all over Europe. And that hunger, and that praise, that, that, that hunger and thirst for God. And they're saying, Pastor Dave, you've been coming to Europe for years. And now we, church is so dead and so dry. People don't want to come and young people don't come. And I hear the pleading. I hear the cry. It's almost as if they're saying, has God passed us by? Is this all there is? Does the church just whimper out? And all the powers of darkness take control? And the plead is, "Please, please bring us a word. Even here in the United States. But the word is coming now that... All over the world, in in small churches and other places, something is breaking out. Something of God's Spirit that's never been recognized before, or felt, or seen. And that's the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit, because He only needs one or two in each church. I don't believe this is going to be... uh, uh, You see, this cry is not coming from major pulpits who are so into their, uh, their human efforts. It's not coming from well-known Preachers, it's coming from unknowns. It's coming from just ordinary Christians who who say, God, I I don't want to go anymore. I don't want to just have church. I want you to touch me and set my soul on fire. Lord Jesus, I want to know you in your keeping power because of what I'm going through. Lord, I'm going through trials and I don't know which way to go. I told God last night, walking through my apartment, praying, and said, God, unless you come, I don't want to go. I don't want to go to church anymore. I'm talking about the future. I don't want to have anything to do with deadness and dullness. I want to see people come to church ready to expect God to move. I want to see people put their heart into it. I don't want to preach to a people who have to be pumped up, but I want you Every one of you, and this is the message of the church of Jesus Christ, everyone in the body of Jesus coming prayed up, faithed up, believing that God is going to meet you and that every sinner in the house, every backslider without being pushed or pulled or lectured to, they're going to come under the fire of the Holy Ghost and they're going to be touched by God's Spirit. You won't have to beg people to come to Christ. And that mountain that is in us, that mountain of fear, he said, come down and like, and flow down like you did from the mountains and melt them like wax. He said, the mountains will melt like wax at the presence of God.
when the Spirit comes down, He will awaken the church to the coming of Jesus Christ. Folks, this is a message not preached anymore. You go to church after church, week after week, and you will not hear about the coming of Jesus. That message is almost, has almost disappeared from the body of Christ. Many young pastors have never preached it. They're not really concerned about it. And I say that lovingly. But the stuff that's given to me when they do printouts on some of the new gospel that's going around in the internet, there's not a sound about the coming of the Lord. There's not a sound. There's not a word about the coming of Jesus. I grew up in early Pentecost. I grew up in a church where every Sunday we were reminded that Jesus was coming. We were reminded of what Paul said, prepare, get ready, what Jesus said. He's coming in the twinkling of an eye, and every eye shall behold him. The Scripture says, when the Spirit comes, he will cry, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Revelation twenty two seventeen, the Spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that heareth say, come. And let him that's a thirst, and whosoever will, let him come and drink of the river of life freely. Revelation 19, 7, the wife or the bride has prepared herself and made herself ready. Jesus said, watch therefore, for you do not know what time the Lord is coming, but be ready, for in such an hour as you think he will not come, he will come. In an hour when... Society is all wrapped up in covetousness and materialism. It will be, Jesus said, just like in the days of Lot, in the days of Noah, they did eat and drink and were merry, and they knew not till it was too late. But this is the message that the Holy Ghost will bring forth as a cry in our heart. The bridegroom comes, be ready. And folks, I'm proclaiming that message now and when the Holy Spirit is in our midst, that will be our cry. And, uh, and with the Apostle Paul, we will love his appearing. We will yearn and long for his coming. We, we will, God's going to wean us from the things of this world. And he's beginning to do that now. Where all the economies of the world right now are being shaken. All the economies all over the world now, there's the, the fear that Jesus said would come in the last of the last days. But folks, this is not a home. He's getting his church ready. He's getting his bride prepared. And I'm telling you, I believe this and I'll never move from it to the day I, uh, I will never, I'll take this to the grave, this truth. I believe that Jesus can come at any moment, at any time. He said he's coming as a thief in the night. And how amazing that, that people look at what's happening in the world and, 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 and they're in denial. They're in denial. They're saying just what they said when Jesus warned of, of the end times and, and what was coming and the awful things that are coming upon the earth. And, and, and nonchalantly said they're going to say, well, things will continue just as they were from the very beginning. Everything will be the same. We'll come out of this. We've come out of other crises. And that will be the attitude and they will eat and drink and be merry until the very last moment, until it's too late. But not the body of Jesus Christ. We are going to have a yearning and a hunger. Is that in your heart now? Do you hunger and thirst and long for his return? Hallelujah. Is that crying you? Even so, Lord Jesus, come. I'm going to close in just a minute, but I, I, I know what the Bible says, that last days there'll be a falling away. I, I know that the Bible predicts and prophesies that many, the faith of many will be shipwrecked. I know that the devil's coming as a lion to destroy and try to destroy and touch and tempt even the elect of God. I, I know all of these warnings of the scripture. And, and I know all of, all of the things that are happening now, the, the, the wickedness that is, we have been forewarned about. About the lukewarmness. About the hardness of hearts of people. But folks, I'm telling you, none of that, not, not one of those 
things can hinder the rain when it comes. There is no power on earth or in hell that can hinder the moving of the Holy Spirit when he comes. He can break the lethargy. He can break the apostasy. He can melt hearts. Folks, there'll be a time, and I don't believe this is too far away, when all of those who would not talk to you because of the shaking around, because of all of the things they see coming upon the earth, and the calamities that are striking so fast and so devastatingly, one after another, till people can't even take it in anymore, and it becomes so overwhelming. There, there's going to be something of the Holy Spirit coming and dealing. This river is going to flow outside the churches and into the workplaces, and people who wouldn't talk to you are going to come to you and just ask you questions. Are you a Christian? Are you a believer? Folks, 92% of our population now says they believe in God. Well, folks, <laughs> just wait. God's going to come upon those who make the confession with the mouth, and he, in his grace and mercy, are going to turn their hearts to him. There's going to be a turning toward the Lord. And nothing, no when Pentecost came, the priesthood couldn't stop it. The hierarchy of the religious forces couldn't stop. Nobody could stop it because the Holy Ghost said, I'm moving. I'm coming down. And I say, we are now in the beginning of the latter rain that's been promised. We've seen the former rain, now the latter rain. And I stand here to proclaim in the name of Jesus Christ that I believe the glory of God is going to come on his church and Christ is going to be exalted, and we're going to proclaim the coming of Jesus Christ, and we're going to be an example to this world. And we're not interested in just crowds coming. We don't have seats anyhow. <laughs> and I'm not saying that facetiously, but what good is it to, to have people come for a few years and, and, and get a taste? I'm not putting that down. But folks, there's no need to go anywhere. It's going to come. Every pastor that hears me now, every little church, those that are watching uh, are streaming in right now. I'm telling you the Holy Ghost is wanting to come down in your house with your prayer group. Wherever you are, the Holy Ghost wants to touch you and revive you, and he's going to do it. Will you believe it? All they had was a promise in the upper room, and we give you a promise. We give you promise after promise. The Lord to us he says, no man stirs himself up to lay hold of me, God said. Well, God's saying, I'm stirring you up, and be, taking hold of me is taking hold of faith on the promise. That's what it means, taking hold of the Lord. You don't take hold of the Lord by just hours of prayer and fasting and urging and, and intensity and all those things. No, you take a step of faith. I have a promise. If you believe it with me, two or three agree together and the church agrees, there is a promise and we claim it by faith and we will put our hearts in it. We will seek God. Yes, we'll fast and we'll pray, but we are bound together by a promise that God is coming down. Will you stand? Oh, God. Hallelujah. The Lord is here. The Holy Spirit is here. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Holy Spirit, in the annex, those who are watching by screen, and those who are watching by other media, through other media, oh God, I believe your word. I believe you with everything in me that we don't have to make it happen we don't work up an awakening we don't wake up re we don't work up revival we take by faith your promise to come and you said i will meet those who wait upon me we'll not be in a hurry we'll not rush to the exits 
we will say, oh God, we give you time. God, if we try to rush you, will we just come and get a sprinkle and run? Lord, you want us to wait on you, to wait in your presence till our hearts begin to melt as one. Lord, I pray for those in this room now who, who, who may not understand what I'm saying, but Lord, they understand what they feel. They understand, Holy Spirit, that you're speaking to them. They feel something of you, of your presence. God, heal their spirits. Heal their minds. Come and minister new life to those who feel dead and empty inside. I'm making an invitation now to those who feel empty and dry inside. And those of you who don't really, you're not walking close to Jesus. And maybe you d- you've never asked him to come to be Lord and Savior of your life. If you're in the balcony, you go to the exits on either side. And here in the main auditorium, you can just step out and come and stand here. And I'm going to pray for you and believe God by his spirit to come down upon you and touch you with new life. Or they minister in song. Let the Holy Spirit, you feel that tug, you feel that pull. Just get out of your seat. Come here. And in the, in the annex, just go forward and walk and stand between the screens. And I'll pray for you there. There's no distance in God. And his spirit that is here is in the annex. Just let him minister to you now. It's a wonderful thing to know that God knows our hearts. He knows what is really in your heart. And he knows that longing you have. Yes, he knows all the the stuff that needs to be taken care of, but he, he looks beyond all your hurts and all your failures, and he looks on that yearning in your heart. He looks forward, he, he looks to that need, that cry in you. I want you to pray this from your heart. Jesus, I need you. Forgive me for neglecting you I repent. And I ask you, Lord, to fill me with your Holy Spirit and show me your closeness and embrace me with your forgiving love. I believe that. I receive that in Jesus' name. Oh, it doesn't take a long prayer. This takes an open heart. Will you say thank you, Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for touching me. Thank you. And Lord, in the annex, those that have come forward, oh Jesus, your presence is so real. And I'm asking you now, for everyone that stands before you with open heart and a need, touch them. Put your hand upon them now, Jesus. Holy Spirit, breathe on them. Let they experience a manifestation of your presence. Manifest yourself, Jesus. You said, I will come and I will manifest myself. Lord, you will reveal, you will let us touch your heart. You will let us know and to feel your presence. And Lord, that will not be our evidence. Our evidence is by faith, but you will let us have joy in believing. Put joy in our hearts now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, just, just hold this a minute. I really don't know how to close services anymore. Uh, I know the Lord is here. And those that came forward. How many believe that God has touched you right now? Just, just raise your hand. God bless you. Just thank him. As-